Hi, everyone. Welcome to our live stream uh, on smart migrations. My name is Rob Duffy. I'm from CloudReach, and I'm the, the service line leader for migrations here at CloudReach. And over the past 10 years, CloudReach has had a long history of helping customers get to the cloud and really uh, attain a lot of the value, business value of cloud services, right? How do they? How do they transform their businesses so that they can meet their market needs and their customer needs um, by utilizing cloud services? And so we've been helping enterprise customers and um, do this for, for over 10 years. And we've developed a really, I think, a unique and opinionated methodology that we call smart migrations for our customers. Uh, and so today I'm joined by a handful of experts uh, on our staff that are really the ones who execute these smart migrations day in and day out for our customers. Um, they have a lot of experience in uh, developing the strategy, building the plan, and then executing that plan to help those customers get to the cloud. So uh, without further ado, let's uh, have them introduce themselves and then we can talk a lot about, you know, really what makes, a, what is a smart migration? why it's important to, to think about migrations in this way, and, and what are the advantages that it brings to the customer. So uh, Lily, maybe we can start with you and introducing yourself. Sure, uh, my name is Lillian Cropper. I've um, been with CrowdReach for about three, four years now. Um, I work in the capacity of a portfolio delivery manager. Uh, also the, the run several tech, uh, technology programs. Um, also experts uh, or specializing, I should say, uh, in, in migrations, data center exits uh, of that sort, uh, with particular focus on AWS. So I think that uh, is my uh, favorite uh, wheelhouse there. Excellent, thank you, Lily. Uh, and Kelsey. Hey guys, I'm Kelsey Luce. Um, I have been with CloudReach for uh, about three or four years now. I am a project delivery manager and I help deliver um, projects such as migration assessments and overall migration factories. Thank you, Kelsey. And Chris, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yep, thanks Rob. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Chris Hall. I'm a principal cloud architect here at CloudReach. I've been with CloudReach uh, five going on six years. Uh, prior to that, was working with uh, a company for roughly five years on a AWS transformation and migration project, um, but I've been consulting as a ar cloud architect for, for roughly six years now. All right. Thanks, everyone. And uh, yeah, it, when we kind of put this panel together, we really wanted to have a, a well-rounded group of people that... Um, understood what, what it takes to, to pull off a, a migration, right, to the cloud. These are not uh, easy or trivial problems to be solved um, by enterprises, but if they are done and executed correctly, there's there's huge advantages that, that companies get by getting to the cloud and being able to then utilize all the, the services that clouds have to offer. So, you know, the, the process of migration um, to the cloud is, uh, is a really important one, and in one, they're not as not always easy to execute. If uh, you maybe don't have the experience, or you haven't really kind of lived through the, the process once be, once or twice before, um, so maybe we can start at a at a higher level, right, and just talk about cloud migrations in general. So, you know, in, in your experiences, right, you've all worked with large enterprise customers. Um, you know, what are you what are you seeing as the why? Why are customers migrating to the cloud? What what are some of the triggers that that are um, forcing customers or not forcing them, but encouraging them, right, to to move to the cloud? Um, Kelsey, maybe you can start and give us some of your experiences. Yeah, I think one of the biggest ones is cost. Um, I think a lot of people have been living the data center life for a very long time. You know kind of having to maintain those data centers um, and just keeping up with even the electric bills of these data centers. And they're realizing that there is, um, it behooves them fiscally to kind of start experimenting or looking at what could the what would the cloud do for them as far as cost, sa cost savings goes. Um, so that's one of the biggest ones, um, but also simplicity. I think that it adds a level um, of, 
you know, it can hold their data and keeps everything a little bit more simplistic to them because that's one less thing that they're having to worry about. Um, Lily, I don't know if you have anything to add to that as well. I think um, some of the things that I've noticed uh, is a lot of time it's being uh, the bit of the IT departments and the, uh, the corporate IT functions are being driven there uh, by the business themselves, uh, mainly for innovation purposes. Uh, the the uh, the businesses and the, themselves uh, are generally moving a little faster or have a desire to move a little faster and innovate faster, maybe fail a little quickly uh, or find if they're going to fail quickly, they would like to do so. Um, so the, they find these uh, cloud uh, providers and they, um, you know, they, it's really easy for them to sign up. Uh, they tend to sign up and uh, without uh, any structure, uh, but they get to do everything that they were looking to do. The speed is really alluring, uh, which drives uh, that aspect of it. Mm. Yeah. And to kind of also add, I don't know if um, disaster recovery is kind of one of those things too. There's um, a safety net there, you know, moving to the cloud that your data is just not in one place. Um, it's in multiple locations, you know, of your choosing all over. So um, there is a safety net aspect as well too. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I, I think the cloud offers a lot of, of technical advantages, right? Of, of over a non-premise data center. Chris, have you seen any other like technical advantage or is there technical uh, reasons that customers start to move to the cloud? Are, are there ways in which they, they're able to like, gain greater efficiencies over a non-premise data center? Yeah, I mean, I think um, probably the biggest advantage is automation. Um, since everything is an API in the cloud, you could technically automate everything. So. <laughs> Uh, I think we're seeing, um, you know, more mature infrastructure automation tools come around. Um, so they're getting easier to use. Um, and I think you're starting to see a lot more people with experience using those kind of tools too. So one thought that I had was uh, for companies that have been slow, they may start to see like as they hire people that have experience and they're still using a data center, those people are probably starting to push and say, I want to use the new technology. You know, I know it's easier. I know I could do this faster. Um, so within certain parts of organizations, I'm sure there's there's those voices that, you know, I came for a, from a company that was in the cloud and we didn't have to do this. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's almost like a, uh, there, there's a top-down approach, right? Where the, the management team is saying we should move to the cloud for some of the reasons like, Kelsey and, and Lily were saying, but there's also a bottom up, right? That, you know, some of the, those internal voices are saying, listen, we, there's, there's a better way to, to manage this or a better way to kind of get some of these managerial tasks done. And, you know, you could do that with cloud and in the APIs that you talked about. Yeah, exactly. What about COVID? You know, we've heard a lot of businesses, right? Are, you know, obviously everyone's affected by it and every business is, has been changed by COVID in the pandemic and working from home. Have you seen a a, a, a different uh, perspective that, that customers are now looking at, you know, migrating to the cloud or different urgency um, and getting to the cloud through, you know, during the pandemic and, and coming out of it or hopefully coming out of it um, over the next year or so? Um, Chris, maybe I'll ask you first. Uh, yeah, I think, um, you know, one thing, one challenge that COVID has brought is a scale for, for internal tools and uh, things like desktops as a service, um, stuff that, you know, you used to not have to worry about because a lot of people came to the office and you had a lot of high speed networking within the office. Uh, now you're dealing with everyone coming through the internet from their house. so. Uh, if you go to AWS, the, the front door is a little bit larger. If you're <laughs> coming from the internet, uh, you don't have to pay, you know, for 10 gig, 100 gigs, who, who knows what to support uh, your entire workforce coming into the data center. Um, so I think that that is definitely accelerated, accelerated some programs and maybe shifted some focus from, you know, maybe maybe a company was only focused on their external facing apps being in cloud. Uh, so now, you know, this brings the internal apps into the, 
you know, maybe it'd be better if those were in cloud because we could give access easier or faster, uh, more distributed, um, all these benefits. You start to look at, you know, the, the internal business applications versus only the websites. Yeah, no, I, I think those are, are really good points. And that's what I, I've seen as well is, is kind of the front of the house and back of the house kind of applications where, um, you know, customers are starting to see the value of those kind of back of the, the house applications moving to the cloud. And so for availability reasons and um, Lily, what about you? You know, you, you manage those kind of cloud migration projects. Have you, is it, have you seen a difference in the way that customers are, are are working with you on those kind of projects and and how they they want to be able to use the cloud once you know during those during the course of that migration right the strategy yes i think there was a little um hesitancy at first uh most people are used to um being collaborative together in the office and uh, coordinating uh, sessions and meetings that way. It, it did take a little bit. Uh, it didn't take long though. Uh, <laughs> people tend to pick up on Zoom uh, very quickly. The biggest challenge uh, during this whole time uh, is similar to what Chris was saying, it was the scale. So now that everyone was forced to work at home, uh, VPNs were stretched to the max. I mean, everyone always had some sort of VPN, some sort of access to the office, uh, but it was not at scale uh, as Chris mentioned. So uh, and then uh, also the, the laptops uh, being shipped out uh, for those office-based workers that tend to have desktops, uh, that definitely um, had a little delay in uh, the speed or the velocity of our migrations after getting over some of those hurdles, but definitely the desktop as a service uh, really um, saved. Uh, once everyone saw the benefit of that, that really, uh, those efforts, uh, we had to take a little detour, I think, is really what it come down to. But um, it was a, it was an easy pivot for most folks uh, once they uh, realized that there were solutions for it uh, uh, fairly quickly. Yeah. No. No. I agree. And um, I'm sorry, Kelsey. Go ahead. No, I was just saying in situations like that, it's just kind of showing that these solutions do speak for themselves. I mean, we were able to adapt really quickly when COVID hit last year um, just because of what we're able to do already being, you know, not only just a cloud business, um, but a lot of these customers moving to the cloud were already able to do so much because of it. So it was just really cool to see the, you know, fruits of our labors it really does, you know, show how effective and how good the cloud can be. Yeah, I think so. And it, it, we noticed, or I noticed that a lot of customers, yeah, they had this kind of mad scramble to kind of get the services in place that they needed right when the, when COVID hit. But then I think after that first scramble, then it was like, okay, how do we actually build this in a more permanent way, right? How do we go back and kind of clean up some of the, the work that we, we did early on in the pandemic? And that's where I think businesses are now taking this a lot more serious of how to manage their environment in a better way um, with the cloud so that these types of events don't become a mad scramble, right? I mean, if you think about, I mean, obviously the, the pandemic is, is was a huge event that affected everyone globally, but regionally, these types of events or interruptions, I should say, are not, are not you know, on a smaller scale are, are, are not that uncommon, right? We had, um, I can remember one customer who had uh, infrastructure and data center in Hong Kong when they had some of their political unrest earlier, um, you know, last year. Uh, we've we've always experienced weather as being a uh, uh, you know a problem that businesses have to deal with if they're based you know in a single data center, right? Or you know, there's even um, you know different kinds of you know power outages and things like that. So like if if you're environment is is reliant on that kind of single point of failure of a single data center or in, in you know the data center that you have in your building then that becomes a a risk for your business and so helping customers first understand that and then um, you know trying to develop ways to get around it and, and those things so you know in order to do that we've at CloudReach we 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 do what we call a, a smart migration, right? And so 
And uh, we use that term, I guess, smart, pretty broad in the way in which we think about migrations because there's, we feel like there's ways to make the migrations uh, more effective and more efficient for customers by using um, smarter techniques, smarter process, and being able to use the data that we have available to us in a, in a smarter way, right? And so um, you know, one of the questions as customers start to investigate and kind of get engaged and, and decide that a migration to the cloud is gonna be beneficial to their business, you know, what are, are the real, um, what are the, the things that customers should start to think about first, right? Like what are the, the tasks, what are the ideas, what are the data that, that's really required for customers as they start to think about a migration? What tools can they use to begin, you know, um, collecting the data that that they need in order to conduct a migration? Maybe, um, Kelsey, you can talk about like when we run a, a migration, you know, what are some of the first steps we you, we do, we go through to collect some of that data and start some of that analysis? Yeah, one of the coolest things that I think we do here at CloudReach are our smart assessments. Um, it's our ability to really take a deep dive into your environment and not only just that, kind of take an overall, a broad view of all of the data that you have. Um, and it's kind of giving us the ability, uh, ability to look at anything that is business critical, any um, type of dependencies that you know your applications may have. Um, taking these few extra steps before going kind of right into a migration allows us to not only migrate everything uh, correctly, but it also shows you how efficient it can be. Um, so during this assessment, we look at your overall environment and just make sure that there's nothing that stands out as a red flag um, to go to the cloud. And a couple of those things, um, you know, that would be red flags, you know, you may consider, do you want to refactor this before you go to the cloud? You may look at what the cost, you know, what that looks like. Does it cost more now? Will it cost more later? Um, there's just so many factors that eventually will show you what your cloud landscape will look like. Um, so one of the coolest outcomes of this is we'll show you, you know, using a tool called Cloudomize, you know, what would your cost in AWS be, or AWS today be versus what it was before. So it kind of gives you a pros and cons list to weigh that out. So really just getting that, you know, bird's eye view of what you have and then giving you that cost. I mean, I think that that's just the most important pieces of information before you even really move into that migration. But Lily, I'm sure there's other things you might want to add. No, I think um, I think you really hit the nail on the head there. I think most folks, um, uh, and, most are, I, and I've been on the other side of the organization um, as an industry employee, and, and uh, m most organizations really don't have uh, their arms around their entire application estate, and I think that can be a little overwhelming. Uh, so the tool uh, Cloudomize really helps in uh, making it a little more objective and, and not so overwhelming. Uh, and then uh, once once they have all that data, it's really important to uh, to decide uh, on a roadmap for each of those applications and the disposition. Most, as as Kelsey mentioned, will uh, just go uh, right to the cloud. But there's going to be a few. There are going to be legacy issues that might have a different roadmap. And you can uh, map that out uh, with a with a tool called Cloudomize because you'll get the entire list, uh, and um, and just makes it a little uh, more palatable to, and, and gives you confidence that this is gonna this is actually a doable thing for um, for the organization. Yeah, it, it's actually kind of crazy. Sometimes we'll get customers that didn't even know their cloud or their landscape before we even run the assessment. So it's actually great for our customers. Um, to really actually have that inventory as well. So it benefits us to help them, but it benefits benefits them because sometimes they find things that are like, oh, we're still running that? Well, let's go ahead and save that money there and get rid of that. Let's go ahead and retire it. So it helps us both immensely, but yeah, it's amazing um, being able to find what you actually have. <laughs> yeah, I'm really after a couple years, so. <laughs> I was gonna say, even, um, even during migration execution, it's good to have a discovery tool um, for those apps that you just don't have any idea. Like it was built 10 years ago. We don't know what it communicates with. Um, we know we still need it, but how do we move it? <laughs> so having having that um, agent that tells you, here's all the connections, here's all the uh, processes we see, um, you know, at least, at least helps you start the process of uh, dissecting 
what's going on with that app and be able to move it. Yeah, maybe Chris, you can talk a little bit more about that. Like, so you get all the data from Cloudomize. It tells you sort of what what's going on in the environment, what applications and infrastructures out there, um, and how that how it's all connected. But then, you know, there, there's a process you have to go through determining, like, how are you going to move that application or that server to the cloud, right? And what's the process that you're going to go through? And you know, maybe you could talk a little bit about that. And you know, some of the things we, we talk about internally is like, how do you make those determinations in a standardized way? How do you how do you have a process in place to make those determinations? But also, what is the um, what is the what are the choices that customers have when making those kind of migrations? We talk about six R's. Maybe you can explain a little of that too. Sure. Um, yeah. So, you know, we we try to prioritize the apps um, first at a high level um, with a you know a high level migration plan. Um, but when we're when we're looking at a single wave of apps, um, you want to kind of dive a little bit deeper. You're looking at you know down to the uh, firewall rules um, that are going to be required, um, understanding the technologies that are in use, uh, being able to identify, you know, things like uh, candidates for uh, platform as a service, like RDS, or if there's something that could go to Elastic Cache, um, you know, so being able to replatform or refactor uh, small parts of it that are, you know, low hanging fruit, basically. Like we know this database is, is simple and we can move it to RDS. We won't have to deal with uh, building an EC2 and possibly building, you know, redundancy on a database. All that stuff can be managed uh, by AWS. Um, you know, identifying load balancers, um, you know, those, those are usually easy wins as well, rather than hosting load balancers for each application using an ELB um, is an easy way to uh, to gain some benefits from from the cloud without you know a, a lot of refactoring um, so the the six R's um, during migration is uh, retire I'm gonna mess this up right <laughs> uh, retire retain uh, then you have rehost replatform rearchitect. I did miss one, didn't I? I think it's uh, maybe repurchase. Repurchase. Re repurchase. Yeah. So SaaS, uh, SaaS solutions. Yeah. So the six R's process you usually try to do earlier on in a migration project. So you want to understand what candidates you have for uh, for rehosting. You definitely want to know what you can retire. Um, you want to know, you know, technologies that do have SaaS. Uh, SaaS versions that you could maybe just move from one, uh, move from the data center directly to, to a SaaS platform. Uh, and then for re-architecting slash uh, refactoring, you, you want to limit that to high value for the business, basically. Um, so we tend to lean on a migration. We want to lean more towards rehosting, just for speed and lower risk. Um, and then identify early on the workloads that could provide value to the business if they were refactored um, and not just go in and try to refactor everything because it's fun. <laughs> um, so yeah, for speed reasons, we we, we try to go rehost, uh, especially in a data center exit. If you're trying to close the data center, we don't want to get into refactoring everything. Um, but you know, we want to identify those. And even if the process becomes we can rehost it and the timeline is short. And then even during the migration project, we could kick off another project to start refactoring it um, during the migration. Yeah, okay. definitely in my experience, the lifting and shifting and then refactoring is always the preferred method. It really helps from a project delivery perspective keep us on track. Um, Cause uh, you know, just to that point, you know, you can refactor alongside why you're still getting everything to the cloud because it's just it helps with speed and also helps with your timeline because you know 
as my job, as your project manager, I want this done for you on time and within budget because we know that customers love being in budget. So, Also, I think it's a little difficult uh, if you uh, if there's delays in the migration uh, where you would actually have to manage to uh, a hybrid environment and those uh, when you start to add that into the mix for an uncertain period of time, if you're trying to refactor at the same time uh, as you're migrating uh, can be a little uh uh, challenging for the organizations, it'll definitely stretch the resources and the cost. <laughs> definitely, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> so we, we yeah, no, I think as much as possible. Yeah, I think with rehosting, right, you can follow predictable patterns. Right, so it's a it's a little easier. It's a little more predictable, and so that way you're able to kind of. You know, with with replatforming, there's a lot more customized code and development work that has to be done, and you know, it can be very valuable for the business in some cases. But you know, it becomes a bit of a challenge, especially in a large migration. Uh, you know, one of the one of the LinkedIn uh, users in the chat asked a good question that I think uh, you know either Kelsey or Lily, maybe you guys could answer: is what is a typical timeline for a migration? Right as uh, what what your customers expect from a, a duration of these types of projects? I uh, I think that depends on the size of the organization. I have been on a uh, migration uh, where we were able to. And it was a very large company. It was a Fortune 50 company. We were able to empty the data center uh, in, in which included a, uh, a mainframe migration. Believe it or not, uh, in about a year uh, there was. Uh, and we're talking in the upwards of hundreds of application uh, migrations. Uh, on average, I think every each uh, each large enterprise migration can take uh, six to eight weeks. Of course, this can go in parallel. Uh, you don't. It's not a linear process. But I think uh, definitely um, within a year for a large enterprise is a is, is a realistic expectation and achievable. Yeah. Um, and Kelsey, maybe you could say talk a little bit about how do we try and optimize that right here at CloudReach. We talk about these smart migrations really having the way to to try and you know move these things along as fast as possible. You know, so how do you in the projects that you work on try and optimize that timeline and, and make it run as fast as possible? Yeah. Um, so what we've done with these smart migrations, number one, you get a thorough assessment. So again, you're you're fully aware of what's in this landscape. So then you plan it around to Chris's point, you know, what you can go ahead, what's the low hanging fruit, lifting and shifting. Let's get everything that we can in the cloud now um, and just kind of have those small victories, those small wins, just so that we're already getting that momentum. So that's one way to really pick up the pace and make sure that we stay on that timeline because um, there is always going to be some contingency for anything that we run across while migrating. Um, but I think the biggest thing is always planning ahead. So we like to work with an agile approach. Um, and Lily, of course, can talk about this as well Is you know, we make sure to meet with our customers very often, making sure that we're staying on top, planning ahead, grooming the backlog, making sure that everything is getting addressed and risks are being called out early. Um, you know, I think those are key parts of project delivery that do go a little bit um, overlooked, but those are really what help us stay on track because we make sure our technical team and our project management team are aligned so that we're able to really mitigate any risk or any potential timeline issues that we run across. Yeah, no, and that that's really, I think the planning process is, is often overlooked. People want to get right to migrating, but the more time you spend planning and developing a solid process, the better off you're going to be and, and make that, that actual move smoother. Hey, uh, Chris, what do you, um, what do you see as, you know, the major pitfalls that, that, you know, companies or businesses fall into as they do these migrations? Are there kind of challenges that you see that, um, you try and address or head off before uh, they become problems for those customers? Um, I guess a, a couple that come to mind. Um, so there is there is over planning, right? So planning is good, but um, you can analyze, you can have analysis paralysis, basically. Um, you could You could look at every app 
down to the detail for months and have this solid plan. And I guarantee the plan will change. <laughs> the, you know, the business doesn't stop for migration. Um, app owners are constantly trying to improve their apps, hopefully, if they're good app owners, uh, which could lead to changes to the apps, um, you know, changes to the app lifecycle. Um, so definitely plan, um, but you want to time box the planning exercise. Um, you don't want to spend as much time planning as you're going to spend migrating. Uh, come up with high level plan, um, then start digging into digging into the details in chunks, like picking out the apps that, that kind of fit together in terms of risk uh, and technology and you know business uh, priority. Um, so I think planning is one. Uh, another thing I see is um, technology constraints uh, that are put in place by the technologists themselves. It's not really a business requirement, but things like uh, OS versioning or you know we want to stop using certain technology or you know they they try to use uh, migration as a uh, an exercise to uh, kind of clean up a, a year's worth of technical debt sometimes, um, which is good. I mean, it's it's good to improve where you can, um, but you have to be able to accept uh, exceptions to your rules. So if if it's going to take six months to switch this app from an old version of the app to a new version because you, just because you wanted to, because you don't want to run an old version in the cloud, um, you need to be able to say, "All right, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> we should move it. We should still improve once we get to the cloud, but we don't. We don't want to get in way in the way of a our migration project." It's it's important to remember what your uh, your business outcomes, your uh, critical success factors are on this on a particular migration project. Uh, it's really easy to get caught up in. Um, in enhancements and feature releases and, and uh, all kinds of additional uh, projects that you would, of course, that are valued and important, but not necessarily specific to the migration goal. Yeah, no, and I, I think it sounds like speed is, is really important. And Kelsey, maybe you could talk about how like a standardized process really helps with that, right? And not only from a to increase velocity, but also from a, a planning perspective, right? Yeah, I just think from the planning perspective, it's the clarity. It's kind of being able to see what each deadline is and what you're working towards as a goal. Because to Lily's point, you can get lost kind of in those weeds of kind of looking at the new shiny objects that you could do to make it and improve it on the way to the cloud, which, um, you know, we all do that. We're all like, you know, if we're going to do it, we should do it right. Um, but having these set plans, it really shows you where you're moving, how you're going to get there. And it really does keep the team on track knowing that, you know, say you do it with wave planning, you know, we're done with wave one, we're moving on to wave two, just so it doesn't get too diluted with any of those additional details. So that's kind of the biggest part of the planning that really helps to um, keep everything on track because everyone loves to be able to just tick off the box of when they're completed with, you know, wave one, wave two. Um, I'm not sure about you guys, but whenever you can check off something on a to-do list, it gives you that really great sense of satisfaction. So knowing that you can get there faster and not, you know, kind of run around it with all these details is, you know, really what helps, you know, me and my teams. Excellent. Yeah, checkboxes are hallmark of a, a great product project manager, right? Yep. <laughs> um, yeah, and I think it, it, it comes down to, at least it sounds like it comes down to experience, right? Like understanding what the process is. You know, Chris, you said it, it's important to plan, but not plan too much. Like, so how do you know the difference? And so, you know, what are maybe, you know, maybe each of you could, could say some of those best practices and less hard won lessons learned that you've kind of learned throughout a, you know, doing these types of migrations and, and managing, you know, multiple um, enterprise customers, right? What are some of the best practices that you've learned along the way? Um, maybe Kelsey, you want to start? Yeah, um, along the way, some of the things that 
I've learned is number one, establish overall project, you know, who the team is, whose role is what, and getting that established along with a customer. Um, that really helps things to flow really well. And I know that that's not necessarily a technical best practice. It's just the project management best practice. Um, also, just being able to stay on track, you know, ensuring that when you're having these calls with customers, again, you're not going into the weeds, you're not going beyond the scope of work. So just having those set um, boundaries with your customer and making sure that they're aware, like, this is what these calls are for, this is what we're doing. Um, those are huge. But just bringing to the table, you know, a level of understanding and these boundaries is number one, one of the things that, you know, I've learned over being a project manager and also realizing that out of scope stuff is great. We will keep a running document of things that you want to visit down the road, um, but just never really veering from the end goal. So, Lily, I know you probably have some portfolio delivery manager stuff to tack on to that. Um, I think in general, my, one of my favorites is uh, make, uh, ensuring that we have um, the right decision makers. Uh, you'd be surprised at some of the things, uh, and they're small. They end up being small things, but I really like to, uh, especially when we're running agile projects, we we have a, a list of our blockers uh, when we're running these programs. And uh, if a blocker is on one work stream, it's probably a, a, the same type of blocker on another. Uh, a lot of times it could be resource related shortages. Uh, maybe the decision maker is not uh, uh, known. Uh, a lot of times it, teams are waiting on a decision and uh, I think it's not super clear who is the right decision maker for that particular process. So I'd like to uh, ensure that we have uh, you know the, uh, the scrum of scrums uh, sessions uh, to ensure that we can cover all the blockers and make sure that we have my favorite of course is uh to have the decision makers on those teams uh particularly the the security and the networking uh resources uh, those tend to um be the, the the forgotten resources to be assigned to these projects yeah chris any other best practices you've you've picked up along the way uh i think from the architect's perspective, um, one thing that has changed over time with migrations is uh, the landing zone. Um, so another part of planning is uh, designing a landing zone. Uh, so the AWS accounts, VPCs, IAM, all the configuration you need at the platform level uh, to be able to migrate apps. Um, and I think the, the biggest shift or the biggest changes we've seen is that uh, well, first of all, the landing zone is a pretty standard uh, thing now. So Amazon has products that help you manage uh, multiple AWS accounts, even provision the accounts in an automated way. Uh, control tower, you know, is is pretty much the standard. Um, so since you have that, and then uh, we've over the years we've uh, gained flexibility in uh, networking. Um, so one thing that that used to take a a lot of time previously in migrations was, you know, going back and forth with the network team, negotiating for IP space, um, trying to plan for maybe years worth of applications living in the cloud, um, and I think now it's much more modular, um, and you have a lot more options at the network tier. Um, so with, you know, transit gateways, um, being able to add IP space to v existing VPCs, being able to share subnets across accounts. All these things let you um, get started more quickly and know that you're going to be able to support whatever comes further down the migration or past the migration. Um, so that's a, it's another opportunity to, to save time up front, you know, get started with the kind of the minimum viable landing zone. You know this is what you need for migration or even the first stages of migration, and then you can grow and add uh, to your landing zone as you go along. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And I think it's, yeah, one of the things that um, has come up a lot during this conversation is, is right, the, having a customer that has the right expectations, right? In the, and, and so, you know, maybe um, Lily, you, you talk about, 
you can maybe talk about how you manage those customer expectations, but what, what really should be that customer's expectation is in this project about like how much, how much they're going to have to be responsible for Like what, what, you know, what resources are they going to have to put in this kind of project to be successful? I'm assuming that, you know, this is a collaboration, these types of migrations. It's not something that the, the IT team just goes off and does, right? It's, it's, you really need a collaboration from a lot of people. I think the, the area <clears throat> that tends to be uh, overlooked a little bit or maybe not uh, uh, well understood enough, but would be the, the uh, resource availability for, from the application teams in terms of uh, knowledge and uh, validation, testing, making sure that uh, it is being transferred correctly. So it's important to make sure that, uh, that we coordinate with the app teams uh, they do have a role in this. Uh, this isn't done in isolation. Uh, we definitely work with the app teams to make sure that we understand what their, their blackout dates are. There are certain constraints that the teams have in place and, and what availabilities they have for their subject matter experts. I think that's probably the, the, the key. Uh, and then, of course, we, we want to make sure that we have the, um, and again, I, can't, I cannot emphasize this in, enough, but the right uh, decision makers with the accountability uh, to make architecture decisions, to make security decisions, and to make networking decisions. Uh, those are the ones that uh, uh, need to be available to, to make those decisions in a timely manner. Yeah, no, I, I think that's that's really good. And Kelsey, what about you through our smart migration process? Like how do you uh, kind of help, how do you use that to help customers through through this? type of engagement with a lot of change going on in their environment? Yeah, um, what I always like to tell customers is ask all the questions, ask as many questions as you can. And of course, for my team at CloudReach too, you know, we want the customer, we want our staff to also be empowered to ask as many questions as they can. Um, where I've seen some of the pitfalls in some of these projects is nobody asks enough questions. Everyone's too scared to kind of come out and just say like, what does this mean for us? Or how would this affect your business? And therefore things are missed along the way. So ensuring that we're having the right people, right stakeholders on the calls and you know, having enough set of ears, you know, to be able to answer these, that'll eventually set us up for success in these migration, in these migration projects. Um, so really, it's just having that really clear communication line and being able to just ask questions as needed and not be scared to ask those questions as they come up, no matter how repetitive they may seem. Um, so just having that very open line of communication is huge. All right. Yeah, no, I, I think so. And and Chris, maybe um, you know, on that same topic, but maybe do you have any any good um, experiences or, or uh, anecdotes, right? You could share about how in a migration project with a customer where you may you you things worked really well, right? And so you know, how could we replicate that, or how could customers start to replicate some of those those good examples of what to do? Um. So I think. Probably uh, customers that that have done well are are following kind of the the best practices that I'm that I'm talking about, I guess. But more of a layered approach where you're not um, you're not talking to every app owner for hours at the beginning of the project. You're going through the portfolio at a high level, sorting those things out, and then you know adding layers as you go. Um, so once you get to the point where you're ready to migrate, then you engage. So you engage the app owner, um, gather the detailed information, and then you, it can be you know more interactive versus uh, starting off the project saying, hi, nice to meet you. Tell me about your app. I'll see you in six months. Um, so definitely the, the customers that have uh, kind of embraced that, you know, we don't need to know everything up front. Um, they have more success than uh, mm. the ones that want to know every detail all the way down for every app. Yeah, it's definitely an agile process, right? It's something that you have to be ready for change and be 
a little comfortable with being uncomfortable in some of these because you you are making a big change and you, you can't know everything before you start some of these these really complicated projects. Yeah, and I think uh, some of that has come from experience, but also the standardization of processes industry wide. Basically, like migrations are a pretty well known process. Um, you need experience uh, to to not interpret that process incorrectly. <laughs> so you, you can look at the process and then go down, you know, the bad path of I, you know, I just spent six months in this analysis phase where you know that should have taken weeks. Um, so. Yeah, uh, and that's where I think. It, it, Collaborate, right? We've we've spent a, a decade developing what those processes are in developing. You know, we've seen the same patterns of applications and the same patterns of migrations happen over and over and over, right? And so, being able to be able to quickly recognize those patterns and then apply the right methodology, right, when we see them, and and you know that avoids a lot of the challenges that we have, and and using. And so, and this is what you know we mean by using smart, right? And using uh, that word it, again it is using all that information, that historical information that we have, and, and applying it to our, our customer problem. So, um, I, I think uh, we're just about out of time. I, I really appreciate you guys uh, taking the time to talk through some of these challenges and some of the the best practices surrounding migrations. And these are, you know. The experiences that you have, you only really get by doing these things. And so, you know, being able to share those with customers and potential customers, I think is really valuable. So thank you very much for your time. Um, you know, maybe each one of us could take about five seconds. And, you know, if you have a, a good recommendation of where to go for, for more information, um, we can, um, you know, kind of share that as we sign off here. One of the areas I, I always recommend to people is the Outreach website, right? We have a lot of information, a lot of blog articles, a lot of um, uh, information there that it, it not just marketing information, but really good technical information as well about some of these best practices that we talked about today. Um, so maybe I'll, uh, I'll start with Lily. If uh, Do you uh, get any quick recommendations you can give before we uh, sign off? I think AWS has uh, extensive um documentation on it and as well I, we have some of that available i believe someone uh, posted in the, in the link but the, the six hours of migration i think is a very is a very great place to start that really helps thank you chris yeah i think uh i was i was gonna say aws as well um if you look at the uh, aws map program so we're a map partner um that's you know the high level process that i was talking about that's uh, well understood time tested you know <laughs> it's it's what every aws partner should be using if they're not um and that's that's where we build our foundation and how we're able to you know start automating and uh pulling our experience in to hopefully make that process you know even faster yeah that's a good one and kelsey yeah, um, to your point, actually, I would say go take a look at some of our use cases on our website and, you know, whatever business that, you know, you may have, you know, there's pretty much an example for everything from healthcare to transportation. Um, just take a look at what we've done in the past to see maybe how it could potentially impact your business as well and just see if it's a good fit for you. So um, definitely take a look there. Excellent. That's a great, great, uh, great suggestion. I'll, I'll give one more. And then I'll sign off and say goodbye. Um, so Cloud Reach has its own podcast. I think there's over 100 episodes right now. And, and really, they talk about all these topics of, of cloud and, and how enterprises are using cloud um, it, to transform their business. And they do it in a very approachable way without the, the kind of bluster that you normally hear in those, in those kind of technical podcasts. So it's really, I think, a fun... Um, way to kind of learn a lot about the cloud. And there's a lot of uh, industry experts that kind of join the podcast in different ways. And so it's, it's, it's a, a great, great resource. You should uh, definitely check it out if you don't already know about the, the cloud busting podcast. So uh, with that, I will uh, say goodbye and say thank you to everyone for joining us. And um, if there's any questions that we can answer at CloudReach, please feel free to reach out.
Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye. See you guys.